Welcome to Shenandoah University's River Campus at Cool Spring Battlefield. The 195 acres which comprise this property were once part of an approximately 1,100 acre plantation established in the late 1790s when Thomas Parker, a veteran of the American Revolution, purchased the land from an early settler, Ralph Wormley. Construction on the retreat, the large white home located just north of where you are now situated, was completed in 1799. The home is private property, so please respect the owner's privacy. Until slavery's destruction, enslaved laborers, both those enslaved by the Parkers or rented by them, worked this plantation, planting, cultivating, and harvesting wheat, a staple crop in the Shenandoah Valley. The wheat grown at the retreat was processed at a mill on the plantation located just outside the northern boundary of the university's property. More than likely, wheat milled here was shipped on flat bottom boats down the Shenandoah River to Harper's Ferry and then sent to markets around Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. In the years leading up to the Civil War, the retreat was owned by Judge Richard Parker, best known as the judge who presided over John Brown's trial in the autumn of 1859. While Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry aimed at destroying slavery failed, evidence suggests a contingent of enslaved people in various places throughout Clark County were inspired by Brown's actions and lashed out in various ways against their enslavers, including killing livestock and arson, which reportedly occurred here at Judge Parker's retreat. Brown's raid not only widened the gap between free and slave states to a nearly unbridgeable point, but proved a harbinger of things to come for the Shenandoah Valley and the retreat during our nation's most tumultuous and defining moment, the Civil War. Throughout the Civil War's four years, armies of blue and gray frequently moved through this area as they utilized Snickers Gap, located to the southeast of Parker's retreat, to move across the Blue Ridge Mountains. Today, the passage in the Blue Ridge that carries travelers via Route 7 over the mountains was regarded as one wartime correspondent described it as a strategic point of the first magnitude. While dozens of military actions occurred in the vicinity of Snickers Gap, none was larger or costlier than the Battle of Cool Spring. After marching to within sight of the Capitol Dome in Washington, D.C. on July 11, 1864, the capital of the United States seemed within Confederate General Jubal Early's grasp. However, with the imposing Fort Stevens in his front and news that additional Union reinforcements were on the way to defend Washington, Early withdrew his command on the night of July 12th. Four days later, Early's army crossed Snickers Gap and then moved across the Shenandoah River at Castleman's Ferry. By the time Early's army reached Snickers Gap, it was exhausted. Over the previous month, Early's troops covered hundreds of miles moving from Petersburg's defenses to Lynchburg, then north through the Shenandoah Valley into Maryland, Washington's outskirts, and then back to the Old Dominion. After a month of intense marching and fighting, the one thing early soldiers wanted was rest. However, they would not get it as a Union force of approximately 25,000 men commanded by General Horatio Wright pursued. Throughout the day on July 17th, Union General Alfred Dufay's Cavalry Division attempted to dislodge Confederates from General John B. Gordon's division defending Castleman's Ferry, but all efforts proved futile. After additional attempts to drive the Confederates from Castleman's Ferry the next morning, Generals Wright and George Crook decided to move Colonel Joseph Thoburn's division through paths in the Blue Ridge Mountains traverse the ground of Judge Parker's retreat, cross the Shenandoah River at Island Ford, turn south, and flank the Confederates at Castleman's Ferry. As Thoburn's men crossed the Shenandoah around 3 p.m., the van of his column, Colonel George Wells' brigade, drove back a group of Confederate pickets from the 42nd Virginia Infantry. Wells' men captured 12 Virginians. From those prisoners of war, Thoburn learned that two Confederate divisions were within a mile or two of Island Ford. Alarmed, Thoburn asked Crook if he should still turn south. Crook ordered him to stay put and take as strong a position as possible. 
as Thoburn's command of approximately 5,000 men established lines on the Cool Spring Plantation and Westwood Farm, General Robert Rhodes and General Gabriel Wharton's divisions approached their position. Spying the Confederate advance, General Crook appealed to General Wright to withdraw Thoburn's troops to the river's eastern shore. Wright refused and instead promised to reinforce Thoburn with General James Ricketts' division. Around 5 p.m., the Confederate attack commenced. First, with Wharton's division striking the southern end of Thoburn's line, and then Rhodes' division striking Thoburn's northern flank. Rhodes' initial assault overwhelmed Colonel Samuel Young's command, a hodgepodge of dismounted Union cavalry. Some of Young's command panicked and retreated across the Shenandoah River. Thoburn reacted quickly and began to reposition his regiments to meet the threat to his northern flank. While these efforts largely proved effective, at times it created confusion and prompted some Union soldiers, such as those in Colonel Daniel Frost's brigade, to retreat across the Shenandoah River. Retreat, however, was not without its perils. Although drought in the summer of 1864 kept the Shenandoah's waters relatively low, some Union soldiers drowned in Parker's Hole, a deep chasm amid the river's otherwise fordable waters. After portions of Young's and Frost's commands bolted, it seemed that around 6 p.m. help had finally arrived when Ricketts' division reached the Shenandoah's eastern shore. However, Ricketts refused to cross, believing nothing would be gained by doing so. Much to Crook's and Thoburn's dismay, Wright supported Ricketts decision. Although Thoburn's command received no additional infantry support, fire from three artillery batteries positioned in the bluffs on the Shenandoah's eastern shore greatly aided Thoburn's efforts in fending off several Confederate assaults that evening. Darkness ended the fighting and Thoburn withdrew what remained of his command. Of the nearly 13,000 Union and Confederate troops engaged at Cool Spring, more than 800 were killed, wounded, or declared missing after the battle, thus making the Battle of Cool Spring the largest and bloodiest battle fought in Clark County. The day after the battle, General Early received news that Union forces commanded by General William Avrell were advancing from Martinsburg to Winchester. With Wright in his front and the threat of Avril getting in his rear, Early withdrew his army west on the night of the 19th toward Winchester and then marched south to Strasburg. In the battle's aftermath, Thoburn's veterans tried to comprehend why they did not receive the support promised and who should ultimately shoulder responsibility for the defeat and the loss of nearly 400 comrades. Some believed General Wright intentionally withheld rickets to tarnish Crook's reputation. The 18th Connecticut's Corporal Charles Lynch penned in his diary, soldiers were discouraged and mad, saying some hard things about General Wright. Although Wright defended his decision to support Ricketts' refusal to cross the Shenandoah, believing it would not have altered the battle's outcome, Thoburn's veterans disagreed and felt betrayed. For decades after the conflict, Thoburn's veterans voiced their displeasure and refought the battle in the pages of the National Tribune and regimental histories. For the Confederates, Cool Spring became another in a long line of tactical successes. However, it would be among the last victories Confederate forces enjoyed in the Shenandoah Valley.